he's hands down the best patent lawyer that we have anywhere in our region and a really great IP lawyer. I think what makes him and how, why I decided to call him the guardian is if you think about when you're growing and building your business, at the time that you raise money or the time that you exit, the things that really matter are from a value perspective in your valuation, the IP that you own and the customers that you have. Those two things will drive value over everything else that's there at the end of the day. So Chris has created something that he'll talk about, his own little proprietary special sauce, on how to take all of the assets that make up your IP and protect them the right way. Fair enough? Okay, I won't really talk about that that much because it's kind of a commercial. And I will just teach you all <laughs> for the next, however long you let me talk, and however long you don't look like totally bored, I will tell you everything you need to know about intellectual property. And first of all, what you need to know about intellectual property, it has no value to you. I'm tagging off of what Joy said. Um, she says it's the most valuable thing. I'm telling you, intellectual property has no value. It is a cost center. It is like buying insurance, right? It costs you money and it doesn't bring anything until you need it, right? So think of it that way. It's okay, intellectual property is a cost center. It's like insurance. Because there's two things with intellectual property. It's like a coin that has two sides. So I have my West Point coin because you can't go out and meet any West Pointer without having this coin because if they bring the coin out and you don't have yours, then you're buying. And if you have yours, then they're buying. So you always carry your coin. And IP is like a two-sided coin. One side is entirely defensive. You don't want to get sued and spend hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars on litigation attorneys because you did something stupid, right? So we want to make sure you don't do something stupid. The other side is what Joy is talking about. Intellectual property can protect something. It can be the property insurance for your intangible property. So what is intangible property? That's what I'm going to tell you about today. So intangible property can be really anything that is proprietary to you. Proprietary means you own it. So anything that is not tangible that you own and the value of that, 85% of companies that are going to IPO or listed on the IP 500, 87% of those are intangible property is what the, makes up the value of those companies. And a good portion of that is the brand for a lot of companies. It's the goodwill in the brand, I should say, because the brand is what customers see, but the goodwill in the brand is what customers remember, feel, and understand about your product, services, you, and any contact they've had with your company, your product, services, or your customer service. It's what they remember. That is your brand. You can try and shape that brand, but ultimately it's what your customers remember. So what you want to do is you want to protect that. You want to protect that from the get-go. And I'm not talking about coming up with a logo or coming up with a trademark because that has zero value, right? That is only there to protect the thing that is the goodwill in your brand. So goodwill in the brand. Oh, that one's lousy. Much better. So what is goodwill? The goodwill is what your customers, the feelings and the, and the admiration that your customers or potential customers have about you based on how you shape your brand and get them to remember your brand, your company's product services, customer service, and your company's reputation in just in general. So companies like Coca-Cola spend a lot of mo money on advertising to get goodwill. Right? They just advertise like crazy. They don't bottle Coca-Cola. Right? They provide the secret sauce. They ship it out to a bottling plant. The bottling plant sends it to a distributor. The distributor sends it out to grocery stores. You pick it up in the grocery store because you like Coke better than Pepsi because they've got you. Right? If you're like me, then you buy the cheapest one on the sh shelf that's on sale and you don't care about the brand because they all taste basically the same and I'm only getting it for my kids anyway and they never complain because they only get soda like uh, with Chinese on Sunday, and so they're thrilled to have it. So I don't care about the goodwill. I don't care about the advertising. I care that it's 65 cents on sale for two liters. Yes. So uh, they they miss out on me because I'm like a I'm like a trademark attorney. I understand what the brand is there for, 
I'm not going to fall for that. But if you're a Coke person, that's fine. You, you have goodwill for that particular company. If you're a Pepsi person, you have goodwill for that particular company. There's also flavor, and that's very subjective. But like you say, if you're buying it for somebody else, it doesn't matter. Um, but your goodwill starts from the time that you start contacting anyone, not just customers, anyone. It's your reputation. It's like a name, right? If you go out and you tarnish that reputation based on stupid things you do early on, that will follow you in your company. And you want to make sure that you're shaping that from the get-go with your company culture. You want to make it as authentic as possible. You want to have something that is just, it's internal to you and everybody that you work with. They feel the same way about your customers and, and the products and services that you're going to provide those customers as you do. And you build a culture around that. And that's the way to get goodwill without even advertising. right? You just give tremendous customer service. You go over and above promising this much, delivering that much, and your customers fall in love with your company, and they tell other people, and those people tell other people, and they get more and more customers, and you develop your market share with a niche of customers that really care about whatever it is that you're providing them, and then you get acquired by somebody, and you can rest easy, because they're gonna throw you out in a couple years. Uh, you know, they're gonna make, vest you again, or whatever, and give you a big golden handshake at the end as long as you don't quit. And you won't quit, because you want, the money, right? Because they're going to take the company and they're going to do whatever they want with it, probably ruin it. But you have done what an entrepreneur should do, right? You provided value to your customers and value to yourself. And there's four kinds of people, right? There's the kinds of people that fit in the box of bringing value to, to everybody else and to themselves, they're entrepreneurs. Then the, one, the ones that bring value to others, but they actually hurt themselves. Those are selfless people, great to have as friends. Wonderful, because they will, they will take care of you even if you are a louse, right? Even if you hurt them, even if they get hurt in helping you, they're going to take care of you. Selfless people are great. And then you have the selfish people. Those are people that take care of themselves but are going to hurt you. Toxic. Keep away from them. Don't hire them. Not worth it. Even if they're the best in their field, don't hire them. And then you have the fools. Those are people that hurt themselves and others. And you just don't want to be associated with them at all because the companion of fools suffers harm, right? And they're going to tarnish your brand because they don't know any better. All right, so goodwill, very important. How do you protect goodwill with intellectual property? I'm looking for the obvious question. It's not a trick question. The obvious question is trademarks. Trademarks. Everybody's heard about trademarks. There's federal trademarks. There's state trademarks. There's common law trademarks. There's trademarks coming out the kazoo in the United States, right? And, uh, and it's a wonderful thing. You can file for trademarks. It doesn't cost you very much money. You get your trademark certificate. Voila! Worth a lot of money, right? No, remember rule one is that intellectual property has no value. It's a cost center. It just costs you money. It costs you money to go out and get an attorney. It costs you money to get the trademark. It's going to cost you money to renew and maintain that trademark. It's going to cost you money to go sue people if they start infringing your trademark. Right? It costs you money, the trademark. So we're going to use TM, but we all know we want the circle R, right? So what's the difference between TM and circle R? Circle R is when you actually have it registered with the USPTO. The TM isn't until you have it regist registered with the USPTO. Until you get that certificate, you can't use this. So you want the circle R, of course. Because then, after five years, you can get exclusive rights to using that. Why do I say five years? Because then you get incontestability statement that you file. And now your mark is incontestable, which means it can still be contested. But it can be only contested a little bit less. But anyway, five years later, you get incontestability. And now you're rolling, because now everybody's starting to get to know your mark. You got traction in the marketplace. You got your money from the venture capitalists. You're rolling, right? You've got a circle R for your trademark until you find out that somebody else has been using that mark before me. And now I've got to change my entire branding because they just sent you a cease and desist letter after your mark was incontestable, but they used it first. Well, guess what? Their use of it first is going to trump your incontestability, right? It doesn't matter how long you've had the trademark. If they were using it first, they still have a right to use it. If they were using it just common law, they have a right to use it wherever they were using it, how they were using it. 
So you have to do a search before you file your registration for a mark because they can come out of the woodwork after you get traction five years down the road and you have to rebrand everything. And it's so easy to do a search. This one, I will give myself a plug because I have a 10 minute trademark search class that you can take and it takes about 20 minutes to do a 10 minute trademark search class. But then when you take in the 20 minute trademark search class, you can do a trademark search in 10 minutes yourself easy peasy, or someone that works with you, or one of your, your co-founders, or your secretary, or whoever can go on, take that class, and figure out, ah, this is how you search a trademark. Let's go to the USPTO database, do a quick search, rule out all those that have at least been registered before, or that they have applications pending, and you won't fall into that trap of having the circle R and finding out you have to rebrand your whole company. You don't want to do that. Worse, you don't want somebody suing you when you, when you really don't have any money. You're, you're like, you got traction, you've thrown all of your capital into a product or service, and now people, customers are coming to you and you really don't have enough money to fulfill all the demands for your product or service. And you receive a cease and desist letter and the attorney tells you, uh, I need a $50,000 retainer. And you're like, $50,000 was my budget for ordering more product. And now I gotta pay the attorney, right? Because Otherwise, the judge is gonna close me down and he's gonna give judgment against me for a million dollars or something and I'm gonna be out of business. So $50,000 is going to the attorney rather than just doing a 10 minute trademark search to find out if you're clean and nobody else is using it. And what you want in a trademark, right? This trademark that is protecting your goodwill, what you want in a trademark is not the catchiest Vingley or whatever else you can come up with that's a catchy domain name slash trademark no, it's something that is distinctive and unique to you. People will get used to it. They'll figure out how to spell it. I don't care what, what you come up with. If you provide good customer service, if you provide good products, the customers are gonna figure out your brand, associate it with the product, develop goodwill, and it's going to be valuable, right? The goodwill is gonna be valuable, and the trademark is gonna be very useful because it's distinctive. It's not like anybody else's. What do other people tell you? Well, some other people would tell you, Go search, find out something that's similar and just tweak it a little bit and go out there and try and use that as your trademark because you're gonna be able to run on their coattails or something. Don't do it. Um, don't do it at all. In fact, you should do competition research. From an IP attorney, you should do, sorry. You should do competition research to make sure that you're not like your competitors. There's something called, it's a trademark idea, there's something called trade dress. Trade dress could be the way that your restaurant looks. Trade dress is the look and feel of your packaging, of your product, or of your service. And that trade dress is just as, as important as your brand name, or your logo, or whatever else it is you think is your trademark. It's the thing that your customers are gonna see and distinguish right off the bat when they see your product on the shelf or on the corner. And so that trade dress, unfortunately, most of you didn't even know trade dress probably. How many have heard of trade dress before? Yeah, okay, six of you. Very good. So, um, but trade dress is more important than your trademark. The thing is, you can't register your trade dress until it becomes distinctive. It has to acquire distinctiveness. So what do you want to do right off the bat with your trade dress? You wanna make sure it's not like anybody else's. Right? Because if it's like other people's, there's no way it can acquire distinctiveness. Right? But if you pick something that's totally different than your, than your competitors, then it's easy to acquire distinctiveness. The coin. Remember the two-sided coin? If you acquire, acquire distinctiveness with your trade dress, not only do you not get sued, but you increase the value of your company because your customers start recognizing your tra trade dress early and it spreads. And then you don't have to worry about suing so many people because you're, you've got a distinct, distinctive trade dress. It's easy to sue them if you have to, but you won't have to sue them because it's so distinctive, right? It's not gonna be, uh, you know, like we had a case with Hooters and Wing House and Hooters were saying their orange Hooter girls outfits were distinctive and the black Hooters girl outfits of Wing House were infringing the, you know, orange, whatever the color is, orange Hooter girl outfits of, of Hooters, because they pretty much 
lost on everything else. So that was the big trade dress. But there was a female judge, and she said, um, you know, the servers are not trade dress. They are humans, and um, they lost, and it was bad for them. So don't try and make your trade dress something squirrely, right? Make your something trade dress really distinctive. I like your idea because customers are going to see what you're doing, and if you can be the exclusive one doing that with that look, nobody else is going to have that. That packaging, that trade dress that you can develop in what you can do could be so distinctive that no one else is going to even think any other company is doing that. Right? And if you have patents too, then you're even better off. And this is where the second point comes in. Trademarks are not the only thing to protect your goodwill. Right? Trademarks are just the obvious thing that protects your goodwill. What's the next most obvious thing? Well, copyright is the next most thing, obvious thing, right? Now we're talking circle C, right? Copyright protects your goodwill because if you can protect your ad copy and your images and all the things that are copyright protectable, right? Anything that is, has any genuine artistic value to it at all is automatically copyrighted. You don't have to do a thing to get a copyright in that other than fix it in a tangible medium of expression, which is lawyerese for it can be retrieved and seen again. And pretty much anything that you're doing can be retrieved and seen again, and therefore it's copyrighted already. Now, what can you do to build up a hedge of protection around the copyright and therefore your goodwill? Well, you can register your copyrights. Anything that has any value and that someone might steal and use, you should register. It's really easy. For $87.50, you can register 10 unpublished works all at the same time, and they each get their own copyright registration. That's $8.75 per copyright registration, which is cheap insurance, cheap insurance, way cheap insurance. Copyright is a beautiful thing to protect your goodwill, right? And if someone's going to be trying to knock you off, there's a good chance they'll be stealing your pictures, your images, and your, your ad copy. So protect that. Protect everything in, under copyright that anybody has access to, and you'll be better off. And like I say, you can do it in bulk, right? And it's not hard. All right, so we got trademarks, we got copyrights. What else is there? Well, we're not going to talk about patents yet, because there's something way bigger than patents, right? The biggest thing, the thing that most everything that has value to you is protected by is trade secrets, right? But it's more than trade secrets. It's anything confidential because trade secrets is, is defined in most states, and it's mostly state law, as anything that you have of value, any ideas, any procedures, anything really that you have of value that you take reasonable measures to protect from being publicly known. If you're smart, you know, right? which most entrepreneurs, when they start out, aren't smart. But if you're smart, you go to a presentation, right? You're talking to a room like this, and you're not going to tell them how your technology works, right? You're going to tell them what the benefits are to your customers. You're going to define who the customer is. You're going to tell them what the value, is, value proposition is to the customer. You're going to tell them what their competitors are doing and how yours is distinguished from those competitors. And you're going to zero in on the benefits for your customers and how much they say they are willing to pay for your solution to their problem, whatever it is that you've come up with. And that does not tell them anything about how you do it. Doesn't tell them your processes, doesn't tell them your employee manual, it doesn't te teach them your employee training, doesn't tell them anything about your culture, doesn't tell them how you actually make the technology work. Every inventor wants to tell everybody about how the technology works. So they come to me and they say, I need a patent so I can go tell these people how the technology works. And I tell them, I'm happy to file the patent for you, but don't go tell them how the technology works. They don't need to know. Right? They don't need to know. They just need to know what the benefits are to the customer. They need to know what the benefit is to the investors, which is really what the benefit is to the customer, and how much sales you can make, and where the technology is going, and what your development plan is, and how long it'll take to get there, and how much money do you need. Right? And if they believe in the idea and they understand the customer and they understand the value proposition, then you'll get the money, maybe, if you talk to enough people. And then when you get the money, you can go out and you can actually 
deliver on your promises, which is, I said uh, the money would get me here, you're going to have to get there. Right? And that's part of your goodwill. Yes? Even the in what the investors think of you is part of your goodwill. There will be trades, there will be journalists, uh, okay, loosely called journalists, out there that will write about your company. And, uh, and they'll say good things or bad things about you based on what the scuttlebutt is in the industry. Right? And if investors are out there and they come to them and they say, confidentially, tell us about this CEO. And they say, this guy's the biggest jerk ever. That's going to tarnish your goodwill because that's going to get in the trade press. And then everybody's going to be talking about how you know, Chris is a big jerk and, and uh, his company is lousy because he really didn't care about his customers. He's just in it for the buck or whatever, whatever the line is that they're going with. And when they come to you, you're going to think, oh, great. This huge publication is going to write a story about me. But they already have a slant. right? They already know they're going to write a negative story about you and talk about how you're a big loser and, and you're, you're, you're ruining the company because you're only interested in yourself and out for the money. And they're going to ask you questions. And you're going to think, these questions are odd. right? I expected them to come and ask me about my technology and my customers and, and what my company is doing, what my rollout plan is. But they're asking me about, like, did you punch Johnny in the third grade? And you're pretty much clued in. This is going to be a negative story, but it's too late because you have a bad reputation in the industry and it's affected your goodwill. You want to protect that goodwill at all costs. If you have to, you'll have a lawyer, not like me, but some other lawyer, will call them and say, if you print an article negative about my wonderful CEO that's false, we're going to be suing you into the Stone Age because that would be, that would be libel and slander and, and we would... We would love you to disparage us because right now we need someone to sue so we can get more word out about our company. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, they'll reconsider putting in the more salacious, less verifiable facts that they got from that investor that somehow you ticked off and you have no idea how. But you're going to protect that goodwill, yes? Okay, how else can we protect the goodwill? We now have trademarks, copyrights, we have trade secrets. But remember, that could be anything confidential that you take reasonable measures to keep from becoming publicly known. OK, we can finally talk about patents. Most of you won't need patents. You know, the kitchen counter thing, you need a patent or two, right? You have a patent or two? Provisional patents. OK, so you've got patent applications that are pending. Someday, down the road, a decade from now, they will issue. And uh, your investors are happy with that. And so you have what you need to protect you as far as patents go. I use Circle P for patents because I came up with that on my own. And I use that. So patents, Circle P. Um, this is how I make most of my money. I do patents. This is what I spend a lot of my time on teaching entrepreneurs. This I don't spend a lot of time on teaching entrepreneurs. You need patents. You need a patent attorney. You, if you need a patent, you need patents. If you need patents, you need a really good patent attorney. You don't need a mediocre patent. If you don't need patents, then you don't want to spend any money on patents. Because, remember, intellectual property has no value to you. It's a cost center. Only if patents can protect this goodwill of yours that you're building up, the 87% value do you need patents? Or if you're in a highly technical area and you can't keep it a trade secret, and, 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 then eventually you're going to need not one patent, not one patent application, but you're going to need issued patents down the road because people will knock you off and you'll have to sue them. And you're going to have to account for that. You're going to have to have a war chest and be ready to sue them when they start infringing your patents. But that is an expensive business. Two million dollars for the average patent lawsuit like six years ago, and it only goes up, right? Patent attorneys never reduce their fees, they just increase them. Um, so that value is, I don't know what it is now, but it's going up. So if you don't need that, avoid that like the plague. Now, why would you need it? You are, want investors and they demand that you have patents. Well, okay, then you need a patent, but you don't necessarily need the best patent attorney in the world because you don't even care if it issues. Once you have the patent filed and you have the money from the investor, woohoo! go out and blow a little money on a steak dinner, and you have your application, you have your investor happy, 
and you go down the road and you worry about the things that matter, right? Because you got your money and you can get your business launched and you can get your product out the door and you can build goodwill. But many investors now don't want you wasting money on patents too. And if they ask you, it could be they're asking you because they're stupid and they don't know you don't need patents, or it could be they're asking you to trap you to see if you think you need patents, right? So just answer them truthfully, say, you know, well, we're really more interested in keeping our trade secrets, copyrights, and, and trademarks so that we can build goodwill with our customers, be, be a, a large player in the market, capture more of the market, and that's where we want to spend our money. We want to spend our money on our team and on getting our product or service out. And if they're the right investor for you, if they're smart money that you actually want investing in your company, they're going to nod their heads and say, well, this guy is a savvy entrepreneur. This woman is a savvy entrepreneur. And you're going to be happy with that, right? You're going to be like, yes, I, I pitched this and I, I did the right thing. And I listened to Chris Paradise back in that class, back in University of Tampa, and they actually bought it. And now I'm rolling down the, the road with a check and I'm going to deposit it in the bank. I'm driving to the bank now, going to deposit it in the bank because I can get started. Yes? So remember that. You can tell him. Tell him, I had this class in UT with Chris Paradise. He said, the important thing is to protect my goodwill and to build the value of my business. And he said, patents are crap. They just cost me a lot of money. I didn't say that, by the way, because I'm a patent attorney. But you'll say that because that's what you remember. But I didn't say that. I said that patents are only valuable for people who need them. I didn't say they're crap. But OK, that's what you'll remember. And you can say that to them. It's OK. I'm not going to be offended if you say that. I, I won't even be there, right? So, but you, you've got the lay of the land here, right? Okay, so let's look at you. So, how do you determine, how do you determine how to build that value, right? How do you determine to take your company from here, right, on the chart, to there, right? Everything, everything is exponential, right? And if you go into the future, you're not worried about the future, but if you go into the future, it actually goes like this, right? Apple is somewhere here, maybe now, who knows where. But they're, they're, they can't make, you know, they can't, they sold everybody who wants an Apple of anything, they've sold it to them, and they don't have another idea for coming up with another product because their founder is now gone. And they're somewhere here in the mature field, and they're just looking at, well, you know, can I bump up the value another 15, 20, 50 percent, whatever? but they're not talking about increasing value year over year by double, right? You're interested in this increasing the value of your company by double year after year, right? This is where you want to be. When nobody wants to be down here though, right? Where, you know, you have to blow up the graph, right? I'm going to blow up the graph. I'm going to do away with the million dollar mark or the billion dollar mark, and I'm going to make it a $10,000 mark, and therefore, it looks exponential, right? <laughs> it's exponential down there too. It's just nobody cares about that exponent, right? They don't care that you're going from 10,000 to 20,000 next year because, you know, their grandma could give you 20,000. They're interested in how you're going to get here. When you're talking about going from 1 million to 2 million or 2 million to 10 million or 10 million to 100 million or 100 million to a billion, right? They're worried about this, this fast growth part, especially if you're looking for money from like venture capitalists. They're looking for how can you increase your value by four, five, six, ten times the money I'm going to give you, right? Because they want to get that amount back because they're losing on like every other investment they made because they're listening to some people who they had successes sometime past in their past, but they're looking for their next success and it's been a while. So, you know, they, they need that ten times because they have nine other investments that are going like this. Woohoo! Crash, right? And now they're in the red, right? And they're selling off assets. Patents are good for selling off assets, by the way. I've had companies that went belly up and they sold off their patents for seven, eight figures, and their investors were happy because they got whopping big checks just for their patents. But that's because they had a technology that some huge multi-billion dollar company wanted to buy. Yes? They didn't want to buy the business. They just wanted to buy the patents because they needed more patents in their portfolio to fend off you know, defense on the one side of the coin, fend off other people from suing them, and on the other side of the coin to be able to sue other people if they were infringing their technologies. And it just happened to be a nice patent portfolio sitting right out there in front. 
of what everybody else was doing and where they were bound to go. And because if you get that patent portfolio, it's called a blocking patent. Nobody can get there unless they pay a toll. Right? That's a beautiful patent portfolio. I've had maybe three in my two decades plus of blocking patent portfolios. Spent $25,000 before we filed the first patent on one of them, just doing the patent research to find out where people were going in the future so that they could then do the research that would get the blocking patents so that they would have an asset that was valuable that they could license and sell to a multi-billion dollar company, right? So if you're doing that, get the best patent attorney you can. Get someone who's gonna spend time and give them 25,000, uh, it's probably $50,000 now. Give them $50,000 out of your budget and say, tell me everything anybody's doing in this field and tell me who the big players are that I'm going to have to negotiate with down the road and tell me where they're going. And if you can tell me all that, you know, you're, you're worth more than $50,000, right? Maybe they'll, you can find a younger patent attorney, his billing rate hasn't gone up to $900, that would do it for less than $50,000 but you don't really want to find one that's not good. Because he'll give you an answer, but it's not going to be the answer that makes you any money down the road. And it's a business. I mean, there are people that are just in the business of coming up with blocking patents. That's what they do. You know, they hang around large universities and they come up with ideas and then they try and find out the ideas that actually have value and then they buy up the, the patents or they, they start writing patents and try and block the industry from going that direction because they know the industry has to go that direction. I could write a patent on how to come up with blocking patents, but then it wouldn't be any fun, right? So let's talk about you. Where are you in here, and where are you in here? Um, I just put goodwill as one of the things that is intangible property. There are lots of things that are intangible property. Intangible property can be an agreement you have with the supplier, an exclusive agreement that you have with the supplier and that is really the only cost-effective supplier to use for your kind of technology. And you have an ironclad agreement that they will not sell to anybody in your jurisdiction, whatever that jurisdiction is, worldwide, North America, Indiana, wherever. You've got an ironclad, and that has value. And that is intangible property, right? Because agreements we know are physically tangible, but the things that they protect are intangible. So anything intangible that you can own is intangible property. It could be the knowledge that your employees have. And then what would you want to do if you have knowledge that your employees have? Well, how would you like to protect that? Well, the way that you protect that is also with an intellectual property attorney or a really good corporate attorney who can write agreements, employee agreements for you that have negative covenants that stand up in courts. So you've all heard about non-solicitation clauses, yes? How many people have heard of non-solicitation clauses? If you've worked in a competitive industry, you've heard about non-solicitation clauses, or if you haven't, you've signed them anyway, right? Because they wanted to make sure that if you left the company, you weren't going to go and solicit any of the other employees that you were hanging out with and steal them from the company and start your own company. So you, you, know, you signed a non-solicitation clause. Non-compete, anybody here have a non-compete? Well, a non-compete is a way of preventing you from going out and competing in the industry within a geographically restricted area, typically, against your former employer. Or not going out and competing against your former employer by contacting the former employees, employers, customers, right? So a non-solicitation is don't contact our employees, a non-compete could be don't contact our customers. And that would be if you have access to the customer list and you know who their customers are and you've been, you've been selling or, or servicing the customer in some way and, and they want to make sure that you're not going to go out and steal the customers from them and cause their market share to drop, right? So the non-competition agreement. Um, those two, non-solicitation is usually enforceable in most states. Non-competition agreements are only enforceable in some states. And they're only enforceable if you really restrict them down to something that's reasonable. 
right? So if you say you can't contact our customers for a period of 18 months, most states will say, oh, that's okay if you've been employing that person for two, three, four, five years, they're highly compensated and they've had direct contact with the customers, right? Because you're paying them enough that that actually is enforceable against them. But if you've been, if you're the janitor of the company and you have a non-compete agreement and you're not supposed to go meet the customers and steal them from the company, but you actually never had any contact with the customers, most courts and most states will say that is not enforceable because it's not reasonable. The janitor, you, didn't learn anything about the customers. He's going out starting his own business because he loves doing what, he, what your guys are doing and he learned something about it maybe in the periphery, but he's been doing janitorial services. It's not like he went to a laptop and downloaded all of your proprietary information and took it on a thumb drive, although that happens. But he didn't do that. He just went out and started his own company and started contacting everybody that needed those services, a subset of whom happened to be your employer, employ, your, your customers right, your employer's customers. And that means that he's not using any proprietary information of your company. He's just out there starting a competing company doing the same thing. That is fair, that is fair competition, right? You're not looking in your agreements to stop fair competition. You're looking to protect your intangible property. And that intangible property could be your customer list and that cus those customer relationships you have. That's reasonable. So what is reasonable to you now, remember that. Because when you're running a small company and you're fighting for your life, all kinds of things start seeming reasonable to you, but they're not reasonable if you put yourself in the other person's shoes. So put yourself in the other person's shoes and say, is this reasonable for that person that's doing that particular job and has access to this particular information? Because if you do that, then your agreement is more likely to be enforceable. So non-solicitation non-compete. What other negative covenants are there? You can come up with a myriad of, no, of negative covenants. Non-disclosure, right? That's what intellectual property attorneys like, right? You can't disclose what we're teaching you, the how we do things. You can't disclose that to anybody, including your next employer. Now, how do you enforce that? That's the problem, right? If it's a really complex thing and it's really unique to your company, it's easy to enforce it because if you see your competitor doing the same thing that's a very complex thing that they couldn't have gotten except they just hired an employee from away from you and that employee happened to spend all weekend before they left at the Xerox machine, right? Well, you're gonna check the Xerox machine, see if you can get images from the Xerox machine and you're gonna build a case and you're gonna go to some attorney and he's gonna say, I want to enjoin you from hiring this person and from him disclosing any more information to you because we see that you've changed your processes. You are going along merrily like this. You hired this employee and all of a sudden you changed your process to do exactly what we're doing. And we can show that the person copied documents from us on the weekend before they left and we can show blah, 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 where you make a case. And therefore, that company, if they're an ethical company, they will fire that person because they didn't know they were stealing proprietary information from you and they had some agreement and they don't want the legal liability. If they're a non-ethical company, they will just keep on employing them and they'll have a big lawsuit and you'll have to fight over years and years and years. And eventually, if you did everything right and you did, took reasonable measures to protect your trade secrets and, and all your negative covenants were reasonable, you will win. Well, okay, your lawyers will win. Because here's the secret, lawyers get paid for that kind of thing, you pay, right? That kind of intellectual property is costing you money, it's a cost center. It is a value proposition for you. Do you need to do this big litigation? The lawyers are gonna tell you, I need cash, my kids are going to college. You need to do this litigation. We can win it, I guarantee you. Well, okay, I can't guarantee you. I guarantee you we'll fight hard to win it. Right, and, and you know, so they, they will convince you that, oh, this is, this is an affront, it's just wrong, they did this to me, I should be emotionally upset about this, forget all that. Just back off, get objective, say, is this actually building goodwill for my company? Because it could be building bad will for your company. I mean, there are companies out there that have sued some mom and pop cafe for trademark infringement, and it gets in the trades, and all of a sudden they look like a big, mean ogre, 
that's not good for your goodwill. And your goodwill is the most valuable thing that you have in your intangible property. The things that they learned here, they're still competing with you, right? And you can still outcompete them. You can outperform them, right? You can, you can come up with new things. You could be innovative, right? Innovation is a great thing. You can change your process so it even gets better. It may spur you to go out and do twice as good as you have been doing. And that company that stole those things, they're never going to be better than the ideas they stole. Because they're not innovative. They're just stealing them from somebody that left you and, and wanted to go out and get a big paycheck. And you know, ultimately, you have to make a decision based on business, not emotion, on what you do to protect that intangible property. So for you, for you, how do you determine this? Well, OK. Think of this as Little Round Top, Battle of Gettysburg. You're sitting on Little Round Top. You were able to get the artillery up there. You can see the entire battlefield in front of you. You know from where you're standing that this terrain is the key terrain of the entire battle. And, and we study this at West Point, right? If, if the, if the you know, Abraham Lincoln's troops didn't occupy Little Round Top and hold Little Round Top during the Battle of Gettysburg, the entire Civil War could have been changed, right? We in the South, you know, we could, we could have the capital in like Virginia somewhere and uh, everybody would have to talk with a southern accent and, you know, it would, it would be totally different if the south had managed to gain control of little round top, the little round top. What is it that you have that is your little round top? What is your most important intangible property? The intangible property that gives you a competitive edge against all of your competitors. The thing that you, when you talk to investors and you finally come out with that one and say, oh yeah, by the way, we do this. And they go, you do this? And they go, yeah, we do this. And they say, I've never seen anybody do this. You should get clued in that your little round top. That is your key terrain, right? It may be your, your story. It may be, you know, you come up with those kooky stories that are just, you know, they're made up by a marketing person. You know, I, I'm not a famous person. I'm just an ordinary Joe, but I hated my razor. And I, so I invented a better razor and a better way of sending you the razors every month at $3.50 each when you can buy them at the store for 50 cents each, right? That guy, that's a marketing hoax. Right? He didn't have a problem raising. He was looking for a business that would be something that could, he could come up with a new way of delivering razors to people. And he had a great idea of how you do that. And it, and it worked. But that advertising copy isn't going to confuse me. Right? It might capture some people who think that he actually had a hard time shaving or something. I mean, how can you have a hard time shaving? Okay, women can have a hard time shaving because you've got to like do your whatever. But man, it's just like, I've been shaving the same face since I was about 16. And it takes me a you know, max, if, I, if I've gone two days with a shadow, it takes me max like a minute and a half, right? So I don't have a hard time shaving. I use little Bic razors with a single blade. It doesn't even have the little sensitizer thingy on there. It, uh, who cares? It's like, it's gone. I don't need the guy's blade coming in a month, right? Sometimes I don't even remember to replace the blade in a month. It's marketing copy. It's good marketing copy. He's made a lot of money off his marketing copy, but it's still marketing copy. No, what I'm talking about is a, is a story like um, you were incapacitated because you took a flu vaccine that uh, caused you to have 100% body paralysis. So because you had that experience, even though you recovered after like six months, you came up with this great idea for people who are paralyzed. And you, after you got unparalyzed and you could talk again, you started developing this product and you have this wonderful story about how you actually had, a, had the same problem as your customer and you actually came up with a solution for that customer that really made a meaningful difference. That story feeds into goodwill. 
right? Because your customers identify with your story. That's a real story, right? And that real story is something that's authentic and it gives you your driving force for what you're doing and your entire company is driving force. And it means that you give the best customer service to your customers because you identify with them and your company identifies with them and they identify with you. And that story is your most valuable thing. It's your little round top, right? Don't let that founder go. Make him vest for the next 50 years. And you know what I'm talking about, Joy. Make him vest over a period of a gazillion years and make sure he can never leave the company with a dime unless he, you know, unless he gives you the naming rights and the story rights and agrees never to disparage you even if you're a lousy company after he leaves, which you probably will be, but he can never say a thing without getting sued for like 10 gazillion dollars and gazillions a lot, right? So, uh, but that's what you need. You need that agreement. If you're going to buy that company as a, as a, you know, as a hedge fund or something, you want to make sure that that founder is tied up three ways from Friday in never saying anything bad about the company because you're going to use, you're going to, you're going to ride that story until you split the company up for its assets and, and, uh, you know, load it with debt and kill it, right? So it's a dead horse on the ground. You're going to ride that story because that is the little round top for the company. So what is your little round top? Because once you determine what your little round top is, it's super easy, super easy to figure out what kind of IP I have to pay for, right? You can go to your patent attorney and you can say, hey, patent attorney, I don't need any patents today. He's going to say, well, why are you coming to me? He's going to say, well, because you're an intellectual property attorney too, right? And he's going to nod and say yes. And you're going to say, well, I got this great story and I need to make sure that I protect the great story when I'm developing it. Because once I get traction in the company, I want to make sure I have all the agreements in place that I need. I want to make sure that I have the trademarks that I need, that my branding is clear, that my copy is good. No one can steal the copy. I want to make sure that the trade secrets that I have, that they are being protected the right way. So I'm going to pay you a couple thousand dollars a month just to take a look to see if we're doing our agreements right and our, if, we're, if we're using the right practices in the company to keep things reasonably protected in our industry. And they're, they're going to be thrilled to do that. Right? They're going to be thrilled to do that because they're actually adding value to your company then. They're not just a cost center. They're protecting something really valuable. You know what most entrepreneurs come to me for? Well, oh, okay, not most entrepreneurs. Most inventors come to me and they say, I need a patent. Which starts a discussion. It's good. You, know, you don't have to feel bad about coming to a patent attorney and asking, saying, I need a patent. And then I'm going to talk to them about all these things. I'm going to go through everything that we just went through, but I'm going to do it like in 10 minutes. And their eyes are going to glass over just in 10 minutes. And they're going to say, I just came here for a patent. And I'm going to say, well, you know, you don't have anything patentable. I'm sorry. I've, I've given you the 10-minute thing. There's other things you can do, but you don't have anything patentable because right now that is not patent-eligible subject matter, right? Because right now the patent system is on its head. The Supreme Court a few years ago had a decision where they decided that not everything under the sun is patentable like it used to be back in the old days. State Street Bank hasn't been overturned, but yet State Street Bank, the invention that they had that opened software to patenting, they couldn't have gotten their patent anymore under the new Alice framework. So there's all kinds of things that change in patent law all the time, and most inventors are coming to me think for things that aren't patentable, and they don't care a hoot about all these other things, and they don't even know what their little round top is. They're coming to me for a patent because someone told them, hey man, that's a great idea, you need a patent on that. And that someone was probably 10 years out of date, they probably read some book somewhere or some magazine that said patents were everything, and they don't know that patent eligible, eligible subject matter is only this and there over here. Right? Or maybe I can't tell them whether it's patent eligible subject matter. I can just say, I have no clue if that's going to be patent eligible subject matter. And then I'm going to explain the whole patent eligible subject matter thing. But you know, I'll file a patent for you because maybe the Supreme Court will change its mind. And we'll just keep it going as long as we can. I have some patents that have been going literally more, 
more than six years. So it's been more than six years since they made the decision. So more than six years, that patent has been pending, and we just keep it going, right? Because you can file continuation after continuation after continuation, try and keep the cost down. You know, don't, don't spend a lot of time coming up with new arguments because you only come up with new arguments when the law changes. Law changes like once a year or so. When the Supreme Court comes out with this new decisions in June uh, for things that are thorny like this, um, it may change, right? And so when you get close to June, like right, right about this time of year, and we have a patent that needs something done, and it's in this category of, nah, I don't know if it's going to ever be patentable. Well, we're going to say, but stick with me, because there's another decision coming out probably in June. And we may find a, a way of arguing this patent falls in that category that they just decided. And maybe it's not the Supreme Court. Maybe it's the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, which is the patent court. So I watch those. I watch the courts so you don't have to. Right? That's my job. I'm supposed to know what the patentee guys are thinking, and you don't have to worry about that. All you have to do is come to a patent attorney and say, I need a patent, and we're going to have this whole story. And then we're going to try and figure out what your little round top is. And then we're going to figure out how to quickly protect it at very low cost. So how do you quickly protect little round top at very low cost? Well, today, you got something called concertina wire. Concertina wire comes in rolls, bales you know, big rolls, you hold one end, I take the other, I run with the concertina wire around the perimeter, and it's razor wire. So, you know, anybody coming in the perimeter is going to get their uniform snagged on there, and if they pull, they're going to get their flesh torn, and, and it, you're going to make noise because you hang cans on there. And so you know they're coming for a little round top, right? Because you put that concertina wire around a little round top. Well, what is your razor wire? It's going to be different for every entrepreneur out there, it might be your copyrights. If it's your story that's giving you goodwill, it's certainly your copyrights. You want to make sure you have registered copyrights and everything about that story. You want to make sure also that you have an employment agreement, right, which is part of trade secrets. You want to have an employment agreement with that founder, right, even though the founder runs the company still. You're going to have the founder enter into an employment agreement with his little tiny LLC or his little tiny corporation, because when he goes to investors and they ask the question, well, you have a great story, I, I, I love it. How, how is that protected? You can say, I have assigned all of my name rights, the whole story, everything to my little tiny LLC or my little tiny corporation. And if I walk away tomorrow, I can't talk badly about the company. They go on their merry way, riding that horse, until they're a billion dollar company and I get only paid the compensation that we agreed to in this agreement. Here's the agreement. You can take a look at it. I've had attorneys look at it. It's a good agreement. It's enforceable in 49 out of the 50 states and I'm not going to Alaska anytime soon. Right? So the investors go, okay. You answered that question. You removed one objection. And you're, as an entrepreneur, your job early stage is to remove the objections of the people that you need to join you in growing that company to here. Right? That's your job. Your job is to remove the, that, that means co-founders, it means investors, it means angels, it means I separate angels from investors because other than joy, a lot of angels really aren't investors. They're gamblers. They, they like you. They like your idea. They're putting money in. They think they're going to get a pay, big payday at the end. You don't have to tell them. I'm going to tell you now. But you don't have to tell them that they're going to be diluted like crazy by the time that anything happens down the road like an exit. But OK, it's all right. If they get a percent of something big, it's better than what they had. And they had the whole fun ride because they're going to bother you as an entrepreneur. They're going to bother you like crazy. They're going to be coming in and saying, hey, you said you were going to have your product out by March. It's already April 15th. It's tax day. i got to pay taxes. Where's my money? And you're going to, you're going to, you're going to not laugh. You're going to seriously sit down with them and say, you know what, here's what we're doing with the company. And you're going to remove that objection. Because what you would like them to do as the angel is when you get here to the seed round, you want them to put more money in. 
right? Say, we don't want you diluted. No, no, no. We want you to put more money in with the seed round because you can always use more money, like twice as much as you think, and then, you know, double that, and then you might have the right amount. So you want to remove objections. Guess what? All of this helps remove objections. It's cost center. But you're protecting the most valuable thing in your company. Your little round top. If you don't know what your little round top is, you can't protect it, right? If you don't know, I mean, if you don't know, ask someone who's close to you, right? I asked my wife something, I really don't want to know the answer because I know it's trouble. It's like, hey, honey, why is it that? And then she'll tell you the truth. And you didn't want to really know the truth. Um, it may be, the truth may, you don't have a little round top, right? Your company is little round topless. And that's no place to be unless you're going to college bars. Um, you don't want to be little round topless. You want to be little round top. You want to have something that has great value. You want something that you can stand up in front of an investor and say, yes, sir, I'm asking for $10 million because I have something very valuable. Let me tell you what my value proposition is for my customers. Right? You want to be able to do that. And you want, when they ask you questions, you want to remove every roadblock that they throw up and say why they should not give you money. You know, well, yeah, what about that company? And you say, well, I've, I've investigated that company. They don't do anything like what we do. We have proprietary processes that allow us to do this for our customers, right? And they miss that entire mark, right? It's not, it's not about the product. It's about the delivery system. It's not about the delivery system. It's about the training that we do for customer service. It's not, about the, it's not about the customer service. It's about whatever your little round top is. That's what it's about. And when they say, well, how do you protect that? You tell them how you're protecting that. Right? You tell them how you're protecting that. That's your cost center. Now, when you go to the accountant, he's going to tell you this is the value of that. Tell your accountant he's full of beans and talk to me. Right? Because the cost center is not the value of the thing that you're protecting. Does the insurance policy cost what you're insuring? If it does, you're a fool. Why would you pay the amount, that it, the value of the thing that you're insuring for insurance? The insurance company is making out like a bandit. They'll charge you that every year. No, this is insurance. It costs, it costs a fraction of what you're protecting. The thing that you're protecting is extremely valuable. It's your future. It's your employee's future. It's your customer's future. You're changing lives with what you're protecting. It has value. You need to set a number on that value. Right? And the way that you set a number on that value, how many customers can you get? Right? How many customers can you get with that value? What is that goodwill going to do for you? Or whatever your intangible property is. How does little round, round top, owning little round top, protect you from all your competitors? and allow you to have your market share with your customers, the ones that really love your product or service, right? If you can answer that question, many people will invest in you. If you can't answer that question, some people will invest in you, but you will have trouble, right? You will have trouble because you can't answer the question of what is really valuable to your company. And no. Investors will invest in anything if you have a good team. You can make a great pitch with a good team. They will invest in you. Right. And then you can get here, right? A lot of companies get here, right? And they stay there because they really don't know what their value is. They never figured it out. They may not even, they, this may be like product number one, product number two, product number three, service number four. They, they may be pivoting and, and repivoting and repositioning and repackaging 
And, you know, they thought they had it right here, right? They thought, oh, finally we have exponential growth. No, it was just a little blip. There was noise in the curve. It wasn't exponential growth. Exponential growth, it doesn't matter where you look on the curve, it's the same shape, right? If you're down here, it's exponential growth. If you're here, it's exponential growth. If you're here, it's exponential growth. But what you want to do is you want to have this be like your, you know, let this be your $10 million and this be your $100 million point and $100 million company going to whatever is your cap, right? And you can tell them, you know, how many customers you have and how much each customer is going to pay and you can tell them what your cap is, right? When you're saturated, like Apple. Well, I don't know if Apple's saturated. They'll come up with something new. But, you know. Yeah, they don't have to work too hard. They're making money for their investors. Questions? You can ask me, like, simple questions. It doesn't have to be lofty. What is my, you know, what is my little round top? You can ask me, what is a trademark? I don't care. It's, it's fine. I'll, And for trade secrets, you need something a lot like a patent, right? You need documentation of exactly what your trade secrets are. You need it locked in a vault with Coca-Cola's secret recipe or wherever, wherever they, they, they put that because you want to make sure that that document never walks away. You want to make sure nobody in your company, except for maybe the very highest and most wonderful people, know what that secret is. There are people, you'll have people that work for you that'll know pieces of the secret, right? They might know where to get one ingredient and who you supply and how much of that ingredient you buy, but they don't know how you combine that ingredient with another ingredient, right? And only the mixer knows how you combine those two and what order it happens in and it's a school thing. And that's what you need. That's what you need, right? You need to make sure that's, that's at a minimum, that's reasonable in any industry is to have that ironclad agreement, right? And you want not just a non-disclosure agreement, you want a non-disclosure and IP agreement, right? So that you recognize that trade secret as intangible property and you have them agree the trade secret is this, you know, in simple words, it doesn't give away the trade secret. And then you have a, folio back there somewhere, or electronic folio, that says exactly what your trade secrets are. So if they go and take it to anyone else, you can say, hey, no, this guy signed right here on the agreement, and that agreement said the trade secret was this, and he took it and he disclosed this to his next company, and we're suing that company, and we're suing him, and we're gonna get a temporary restraining order and an injunction, because we can show the judge our file of what the trade secret is, and we can show what they're doing, and it's exactly the same, and we can show the, the uh, files he downloaded to his thumb drive and the day that he downloaded the thumb drive was two days before he gave us his notice of I'm out of here right and you got all the evidence you walk into the judge and he says oh no they got all the evidence they're likely likely to succeed on the merits and they're going to be irreversibly and irretrievably harmed if that person continues infringing their trade secrets so therefore I'm giving you a temporary restraining order and he can't re disclose any more trade secrets and he has to turn over the laptop to the court and we're going to take a look at it and we're going to determine if that stuff is really on there and we're going to have an expert do that, a third party expert do that and you guys are like going like woohoo because you just, that didn't cost you very much.
right? And that settled the case right there. The company is gonna settle with you. They're gonna say, you know, if you don't sue us for a lot of damages, we won't use any of those materials. We'll stop doing that. And this doesn't matter. I mean, this works regardless. Yeah, okay. Right. Yes. Yes. Don't protect your logo because the logo will change within a year or two. Somebody professional will come in and come up with a new logo. But protect your brand name. I mean, do the search first, of course. I just spent how much time telling you to do your search so you don't get sued and, and you make something that is actually protectable? Right. And so and then just take the, do the 10-minute search and make sure you're not infringing somebody else's trademark before you go out and register your own. But yes, absolutely, register it. It's cheap, also cheap insurance. Like, do it yourself, it's $345. Yes. Hmm, good question. So common law comes into existence by use. Not your use, but your use that causes consumers to recognize it as a trademark, a common law trademark. They start acquiring a secondary meaning for your brand name or your logo or your trade dress, and over time, that common law right, consumers start recognizing a product or service is coming from you based on that. And if you can prove that in court, you've spent $100,000. So you don't want to rely on common law trademarks, but they exist. And those common law trademarks are the goodwill that you're developing in customers. So they are basically aligned. You don't have to spend any money on developing a common law trademark. And your first use means that you will be able to use it in the future too. The problem with that is if you don't register your mark, then you can only use the common law mark where you've been using it and how you've been using it. You can't use it nationwide. And so if you're looking to grow a company and you started you know, rolling it out in regions, like you decided I'm gonna do Tampa, I'm gonna start a restaurant in Tampa, and you come up with a great brand and great trade dress for your restaurant, your customers love it, and you start catching on, you say, okay, now we're gonna go out, we're gonna, we're gonna start doing franchises of the restaurant. Well, you put the cart before the horse because you can't do a franchise unless you own the trademarks. You don't own the trademarks with just common law marks. You can't prevent anybody else from using the trademark in, in, in another state. Just go out and start their own restaurant in Iowa, right? You, don't, you can't franchise somebody in Iowa if you don't own the mark in Iowa. But you can register your mark in Iowa, in, in USPTO, and then you have exclusive use of that mark in all 50 states. And you can do a Madrid Protocol application. You can have exclusive use of that mark everywhere in the world, practically. Anywhere that you're concerned about. Yes. It's the same. You have a name for your app, right? It's a, there's a brand to it. You want to protect your brand eventually. You can start with a common law protection of the brand. You don't need to rush out to the trademark office. If you're going to be changing the name and it goes from Vingley to Twingley or something, you don't want to be spending money on trademarks haphazardly, but eventually, sometime down the road, when your app gets ready to actually launch and you're not in like super alpha with your little team of people who are users, your, you know, um, what did the one company call them? Oh, the Divas, uh, Otlight, they make lamps for um, crafters. It's like true sunlight, so they can see the actual colors, plus it helps their eyes actually see because a lot of crafters are older, um, which I can relate to. They called those crafters that they used divas. It was their divas that would come in. They would try out the product. They'd send them home with it. They'd give them feedback and say, whoa, this one's really good. This is really going to sell. And they would listen to their divas because their divas would tell them, but you know what? It needs this or it needs that or I had a little trouble with this. And they would fix it. And then the, di you know, the, the divas got nothing but free merch and you know, recognition as being, thank you very much. We love you. Um, you're our best customer. But... Those divas, your super A round, right, of users, they have an agreement, right? They have an ironclad non-disclosure agreement. They're not going to rush out and tell the world about your product. You don't want them to rush out and tell the world about your product, especially when it's like 
early stage because you've got bugs, right? You've got problems. You don't want people to know about the warts and, and all. You want them to know about the product that rolls out when you at least have your minimally viable product ready to go out in the marketplace. So you have an ironclad agreement with those people that are trying out your software and giving you bug fixes. And if you're smart, you tell them, I want IP terms in there too. If they come up with any improvements, I want a phrase in there that says, all their improvements are owned by the company. And they will sign it because they want access to the super duper pre-Kickstarter version of your software because they're way early adopters that love that kind of stuff, right? So they will sign anything. You know, they'll sign, they'll click, I agree on all the terms that you want to put in there. So put all the terms in there. And that is your, right? That is your little round top, right? Probably. Whatever it is that you're doing that, and how you solve that problem with your app, that is your little round top right now. What's that? Yeah. So you want to make sure that's protected even with those early adopters, even with your co-founders, even with your developers. I mean, don't sign the developer's agreement. Have an agreement made up for you, a company agreement for the developers to sign. Don't you sign their agreement, right? Unless you already did, in which case, I'm sorry. Come see me tomorrow. We'll try and fix it. <laughs> yes? Oh, get somebody that's really good. You need, every company needs a relationship person, right? Somebody that's a lover. They just love chatting with people and do a really good job of empathetically finding out about people. And if that's not you, make sure you bring that person into your company when you're hiring that can just really, when, when they come to you, I, I've always had that. I don't necessarily pick the right person, but I've always had people I could go to that said, what did you think about them? And they would say, oh, I that person's going to be trouble or they had, they said this or, you know, because it was like a secretary or something that met with them and, or the paralegal met with them. You have, you have all these people meet with them and they don't think those people are important at all. So they kind of tell them the truth. But when they're in front of you, they're like, yes, and I worked with Brad Pitt as the blah, 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 right? They're, they're, they're rolling, they're on and you, you just get this fake front. But the, the little people that they don't care about, they get the real story and they come to tell you and, that's the best way, right? Because the little people, you know, the selfish person is not going to treat them particularly well. But the selfless person will and the entrepreneur will because they, they care about at least the, your customers. Yes? Very good question. I would have to know more, right? And, and what portions of the video, right? I can tell you the actual author of the video is the person who shoots the video, right? Because it's the look and feel and it's everything that goes on. But with video, is there a soundtrack? Because the soundtrack is separate from the video, right? There's synchronization rights that's separate from the soundtrack and separate from the video. There's the script separate from the soundtrack, separate from the video, separate from the synchronization rights. A video has many authors because it's a multimedia work, right? If you do all of them yourself, you are the sole author. If you would use it as a team, you want a work made for hire agreement. Work made for hire agreements are very easy to do. It's just you need to define in what category those people fall under. The best category to fall under for, for work made for hire agreements is they are your employees working within the scope of their employment. And then that work made for hire agreement is here in your employment agreement. Because no matter what they make as an employee working within the scope of their employment, you own it as the author, as the company. Yes? If they are a contractor, you do not own everything that they make. You have to have an agreement, a work made for hire agreement. And that work made for hire agreement has to be within certain statutory categories of works. And those are very detailed. And if you fall outside of those, you don't own anything. The person who contributed that, was, that was actually the author, is still the author of that. So you need, if you're doing non-employees, you need a work made for hire agreement that makes you go through and figure out what box to check and check the box. I happen to have one of those. I always said I wasn't going to do a commercial, but <sighs> it's hard. <laughs> I happen to have one of those where you have to go through and check the boxes. And of course, it takes about 20 minutes. 
for you to figure out which box to check. You should have a work made for hire agreement. And they should sign it. In addition to the contract that they have for what kind of work they're going to do for you and how much you're going to pay for them and the development that they're going to do and what their responsibility is and what your responsibility is and all those things and to avoid creep, you know, the, they're going to be worried about, you, you asked me to do this, I did this, and now you're asking me to do this and I need to get paid more for this. They're going to be worried about that. You're going to be worried about, I want to own it when you get done. Right? I don't want to. I don't want to have to rebrand re and do my entire marketing over if I decide to fire you as my marketing company and hire marketing company B because they're better and bigger and now I've grown and I don't need them anymore. Right? You want to own it, and they should be fine with that because marketing companies come up with brand new stuff for you. You're not asking them for their, you know, to to sign over their proprietary processes. You're just asking them to sign over any copyright rights and trade secret rights and whatever other rights in the things that they're delivering you. Right, the content is yours because they're creating it for you, custom made. Um, and if they're not creating it for you, if somebody else owns rights, then you want a license from that other person because, and you want to make sure they have a license so you aren't infringing somebody else's rights. So you have to make sure that that's the case. You have, no, have to know where they're getting their content from and that should be part of your agreement with them. And agreements are hugely important for that. And don't sign their agreement either. I mean, you can read their agreement, but have your own agreement done with your own attorneys and have them sign your agreement. Yes? Typically, podcasting can be a very informal relationship. So, the school is not going to give me a break. Eventually, they'll figure out my wife will pick up and I won't. Um, <laughs> but, podcasting is an informal agreement. You don't need a formal agreement. If you have emails going back and forth that document that you can use it for that purpose, keep those emails as in the ordinary course of business and you will be good to go. Right? So, Basically, if they say, yeah, you can post a link to wherever you want, first of all, that's not copyright infringement, posting a link. Second of all, if you want to actually embed it in your website and they've given you an email that says, yeah, go ahead and embed it in your website, you've just gotten permission. You've got a license from them to embed it in your website. Chances are that podcast is not going to be around 20 years from now, and if it is, you're very embarrassed about it. So just it, treat it as an, as an informal agreement. Don't, don't bring the lawyers in for every little thing. The podcaster isn't interested in stealing your company secrets. Don't tell them your, co your company secrets. He has no need to know or she has no need to know what your company secrets are. You're there to get goodwill, right? So just be friendly, nice. Podcasters are people too, right? Just treat them like people, yes. No, it doesn't mean that per se, right? If the person is actually, if the company has actually abandoned it and they're not doing anything with it in the future um, and somehow you know that, then you can say it's abandoned uh, if you can prove it. But generally there's a rule of thumb, three years after the last use of it, you can presume that they abandoned it, but they can overcome that presumption by saying, no, we just paused. We had a reorganization and a pivot. We were always intending to come back and revive that brand and uh, do X and Y and Z. And here we have a paper right here written in pen and ink from 1999 saying just that, that we're going to pause and we're going to redevelop the brand, reissue it. And now what are you doing? You're infringing, right? So you can't assume that. You have to know it. And the presumption only goes so far. It's a presumption that can be overcome with facts. So be careful with that. There are people that do that for a living. They take old brands and they revive them. Um, you know, have a budget. 
have a war chest or have a you know an intellectual property attorney litigator as a co-founder or something because you're you're treading on thin ice you're likely to be sued sometime and it's part of doing business then you look like you had a question yes okay no, just ask them. The questions in your head never get answered. The questions in your head might get answered, right? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, David. My pleasure.